Hi, I'm David Pearl from Limerence.net and today I'm going to talk about a really important subject, perhaps one of the most important things when it comes to limerence and limerence and affair recovery and that is breaking contact with a limerent object. When I developed limerence it took me a long time to realise the best ways of trying to work through this madness that I was suffering from. And eventually with time, after much reading, much studying, talking to other people, journaling, I came to the conclusion that the best way, the best model that already existed for dealing with, with limerence was the model that they use for addiction. I want to talk just a little bit about addiction. First off, I don't like the word addict and addiction. I think it's really judgmental and it's very shaming as well. When I'm working with a client, and I've worked with many clients with, who are struggling with this coping mechanism, well, that's exactly what it is. For me, it's a coping mechanism. I'm far more interested to try and discover what's underneath the reason why they're using this coping mechanism. So for me, they're just ways of numbing out, distracting, avoiding dealing with deeper, harder, more difficult emotional feelings. And these feelings are not up here in the head where we tend to intellectualize stuff and we stay safe in our heads. They're lower down, they're in our body, they're in our hearts and throughout our body. And in fact, the research now is well documented that shows that a lot of our trauma, our early life trauma from our childhoods, transgenerational, the intergenerational trauma that we pick up from our parents, or perhaps life experiences that have traumatized us, we hold them in our body. They're not actually held, well, the, the memory is in the head, but the actual feelings themselves are held in the body. And there's some interesting books. I'll put links to those books in the write-up to this video. So for me, the addiction model works really well, because after all, we are addicted to our limerent object. And the question always has to be that if we weren't so distracted by the fantasy, by the thoughts, by the mind virus, what would we be doing? What would, be, what would we be working on? And for me, it is the deeper, more unconscious trauma that we're not aware, either we're not aware of, or if we are aware of it, we've boxed it away because we just don't want to go there. And sometimes it can take a long time for us to get to a place where we're ready to just crack open the door on that trauma, those events, or a long time for the memories to start percolating back up so that we can work on them. And it may even be that some of these memories aren't even ours, they're our parents. For me, a good example of that was when I first went into therapy, I remember saying to my therapist after a few weeks, oh, and by the way, my dad was an Auschwitz survivor, but that hadn't affected me. I didn't go through that. That wasn't my experience. Oh boy, I think that was my understatement of the century because with time I realized that being the child of a Holocaust survivor had huge emotional implications on me, had really caused me to shut down. I was raised with this belief not to do anything to upset your father because he'd suffered so much already. And that's a pretty powerful script to live by as a child when wanting to speak out, to be angry or sad or whatever the emotions were that I needed to express as a child. They had to be stuffed down because my father always took priority because he'd suffered so much. And when a few years back on my healing journey, one of the things I knew I had to do was to go back to Auschwitz. You see, and every time I said that, go back to Auschwitz, I'd never been there. But when eventually I did go with him on a trip, and it was an amazing trip for me to start healing some of those wounds, when I told people, I always said every time, I'm going back to Auschwitz with my father, but I'd never been there. So for me, it was the first time I was going, and yet it felt in my bones that I had been there in some way, some lived experience, even though I'd never been there. Quite bizarre, really. So I believe the addiction model works really well when it comes to limerence. And with any addiction, the first step is abstinence. We can't work through the deeper issues whilst we're still drinking, if we're an alcoholic, snorting cocaine, or whatever it is that we're using to distract ourselves. 
because that distraction becomes more potent, more alluring than the pain that we hold ourselves. And what more alluring distraction can you have than your limerent object, than falling in love? So no contact, in essence, really means no contact. It means cutting off all forms of physical contact, social media, emails, phones, texts, blocking everything. Now I appreciate for some people that's easier said than done. Often is the case that the limerent object is a work colleague and they're really hard to avoid seeing. Or they may be a neighbor. Well, they're very difficult issues and I'm not saying for a moment that going no contact is gonna be easy. But it may be that you have to really rethink about moving jobs, going to speak to HR. If you had a full blown affair and your limerent object is a neighbor, uh, that's a hard one. And sometimes we have to look really hard at the consequences of our behavior. And if you really are committed to working on your, your long-term relationship, if you're married, um, we have to make sometimes these sacrifices. And again, I'm not saying that is easy. I feel for anybody in that situation, I really do. And again, from my own experience, I was on a four year training course. I would see the limerent object once a week, every week. And even though we weren't having contact, I avoided her after a few months when I realized this was doing me no good. It still just once a week was enough of a trigger to keep me hooked into the fantasy. And it wasn't until the course ended completely after four years that I then spent another one or two years probably working through the thoughts that in my head before I could then descend much deeper into the work that I needed to do, into the grief, the pain and grief that I was holding for all the, um, all the trauma of my ancestors and, and also for my own inner child who had a mother that was a rageaholic and a father who enabled her and was emotionally absent. So no contact is necessary, but why is it so hard? I mean, everybody I talk to, everybody I work with that grapples with limerence falls off the wagon at some point and they go through such emotional withdrawal pain when they separate from their limerent object. Well, why is that? Well, I think part of limerence is about getting into a relationship with somebody that's quite narcissistic. And I'm using the term narcissism in a very different way to how the pop culture and the media use narcissism. For me, psychologically, narcissism is just an early life wound. And what happens is that when we get wounded, we start developing masks, layers to protect ourselves. And we start projecting out a mask, a persona, the personality of what we think people want us to be so that we get accepted and approved and loved and validated. Because after all, that's what we're craving for as human beings. And if we don't get enough of that unconditional love from our parents, then we will seek it from anywhere else. So we get attracted to somebody that's quite narcissistic, but as I've said in previous videos, they're just a mirror for us. So they're a mirror of our own masks and personalities and personas that we too have developed because of our wounds. And so often when I'm working with somebody in my, in my practice, they'll come in initially and say, I had a wonderful childhood. It was lovely. It was all roses and apple pie and love and hugs. Well, after a few weeks of digging away and chipping away at the, the fantasy of the, what, 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 chipping away at what we call the parental rescue fantasy, the cracks start appearing. I mean, as children, we naturally put our parents on, on pedestals. It's part of what we call the Stockholm Syndrome, where the captive falls in love with their, the hostage, the hostage takers. The captives fall in love with the hostage takers as a survival mechanism. It increases their chances of surviving. And, and growing up in a dysfunctional family is pretty much the same. That our parents are the hostage takers and we have no choice. We're too young to leave. We can't pack our bags and go. So we idolize, we put our parents on pedestals, think they can do no wrong, when actually they are being quite manipulative and abusive. And that manipulation might be quite covert or it could be quite overt. So this push-pull with a narcissist, where we get this intermittent, what we call intermittent reinforcement. Sometimes they're warm and engaging with us. Other times they're distant. 
And that's probably a familiar feeling we have with our own family of origins. Intermittent reinforcement that they know so well with gambling, where the machine pays out intermittently, so we get an intermittent reward, and it keeps us so hooked in. It's addictive, because we don't know when the next payout's gonna be. It's the same with the limerent object. We're constantly looking for a little bit of validation, a little bit of approval, a bit of acceptance, which then triggers the dopamine, that feel-good chemical, and makes us feel so much better. I think also with limerence, deep at the core with us that are suffering from limerence is that we lack self-belief, self-respect, self-worth, low self-esteem, call it what you want. It's all pretty much the same. And it all comes from, in my experience, a dysfunctional childhood from a family of origin where we weren't just allowed to be and flourish and be just accepted and loved for who we were. So often as, as adult children, we're only loved for what we do, not who we are. Be this, be that. So our parents can get some narcissistic extension, some narcissistic supply through that extension, that object that we represent for our parents. So we're looking for that validation and we get it from anywhere. But the limerent object is a wonderful source of our own narcissistic supply. So again, we have to start looking at our own wounds. And the more I go through these series, the more I will be talking about the impact of our early life programming and the impact of our parents' programming from their parents onto us. In my experience as well, people with limerence have pretty poor boundaries. We don't know how to say no. We don't know how to draw a line in the sand and say, this is what I'm prepared to put up with, just for my own self-respect. In some ways, we'll almost take crumbs. We'll take anything just to get a little bit of love, a little bit of validation, because we don't have that self-belief internally that we are good enough. And again, this is where digging into the shadow, the parts I, I deny and repress, it's really important to get a good understanding of what is it that we're not seeing about ourselves. What do we need to work on to grow our own self-love, our own self-esteem, so we're not constantly seeking validation externally? It's what in psychology we call an external locus of control, where we're seeking it out there versus growing it internally and having an internal locus of control. And yes, we are social animals. We can't survive on our own. Babies separated and just isolated in orphanages and given no human contact, they died. So we do need that. And I suppose, and to some extent, we are all just a little bit codependent in our relationships. But the question is just how codependent are we? How radically honest are we with those in our lives? How afraid are we of upsetting other people's feelings and therefore subjugate, push down our own feelings for fear of upsetting somebody else? and a deeper fear that they might reject us and abandon us. And that's why no contact is so hard. And yet, in my experience, with everybody that I've worked with, until we go no contact, we are not gonna get to the deeper things that we need to be working on. And to start really having an opportunity to heal ourselves. So no contact is not easy. You will fall off the wagon. We all make contact again with our limerent object or we go back onto social media to check them up or look at old messages they may have sent us or look at pictures. It's all part of this condition. And for me, there's no shame, there's no judgment in that. It's just part of this journey that we're making. And when that does happen, self-compassion is so important. Not to beat yourself up, not to think you're a failure. It's just part of being human. We are all perfectly imperfect. We don't have to be perfect. There is no perfect way of working through this obsession that we are impacted by. This obsession that we're, we're grappling with. You'll also find on the limerence.net forum, in the members only area, there's a whole section on no contact where other people have talked about their own experiences and you can post your own experiences. I think journaling as well is really important to help you get some of the thoughts and the feelings that might start becoming up. Some of the feelings that are starting to emerge to get these out onto paper. And there are also apps, I think both for the Apple iPhone and the Android, 
that can track the number of days that you've gone no contact. So if you Google those, you'll come across some of those. I'll put the link to the forum, going no contact on limerence.net in the description of this video. So there we are, no contact. It's the number one rule, I believe. The same with any other addiction, abstinence. We have to learn initially to break that addictive cycle, to break the habit. And I'll be talking more about boundaries in another video, more about the unconscious, more about habit breaking as well. So good to see you here. I'm delighted that you're part of this community.